The work you just heard and the work you're about to hear, while they sound like they come from at the very least different centuries, if not different planets, were written just 11 and a half years apart. Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto premiered in November 1901, and Stravinsky's Rite of Spring premiered May 29th, 1913, a day that, as I'm sure you know, lives in classical music infamy, what with the riots and all. So what is it that makes the Rite of Spring sound so startlingly different from the Rachmaninoff that was composed just a decade earlier? Before we play it for you, we'd love to show you just briefly a few of the ways Stravinsky almost instantly launched a new musical era with this piece. His starting point was, of all things, a book of folk melodies. In fact, the famous bassoon solo at the very beginning of the rite is based on an old Lithuanian folk song called You, My Sister, and it sounds like this. And here's how Stravinsky adapted that melody for the Rite of Spring. for Chad. But just incidentally, one of my favorite anecdotes about this piece, the French composer Camille Saint-Saëns was in the audience at the world premiere of The Rite of Spring and apparently said after that opening solo, if that is a bassoon, I am a baboon. <laughs> Here's another folk melody presented with some very inventive orchestration. Stravinsky takes the lowest standard version of a high instrument, the alto flute, and combines it with the highest standard version of a low instrument, the piccolo clarinet, and it sounds like this. So if the basic building blocks of the Rite of Spring are as tonal as we've just heard, what exactly is Stravinsky doing to create the dissonance that the Rite is so famous for? Well, if we jump ahead to part two, there's a section called Mystic Circles of the Young Girls, where Stravinsky has two clarinets play the exact same melody at the exact same time, like you just heard with the alto flute and E-flat clarinet, but there's one little twist. Now here's what this new melody sounds like when the second clarinet plays it. And here's what it sounds like when the first clarinet plays it a major seventh higher. So as you can hear, two perfectly tonal melodies by themselves, but since they're in different keys, when they're played simultaneously, that simple melody becomes dissonant.
catchy. <laughs> well, Stravinsky got just as inventive in this piece with harmony as he did with melody. Uh, for example, take this section I'm sure you may know from about three minutes into the piece. So is this just Stravinsky pounding out random notes or what? Well, that dissonant chord actually isn't a chord at all. It's two chords, and two perfectly tonal chords at that. Listen, in the cellos and basses, we have a plain old E major chord. E, G sharp, B, and E. Doesn't get more tonal than that. Now, in the second violins and violas, we have an E flat seven chord. G, B flat, E flat, and the seventh, D flat. Both those chords on their own are perfectly tonal, but when Stravinsky plays his E major chord with his E flat seven chord, the result is dissonance. Stravinsky also made his share of rhythmic innovations in the right. And there's one passage of particular rhythmic complexity that's now 105 years old and still hasn't been topped. It's a climax toward the end of part one called Procession of the Sage, and it has no fewer than nine distinct rhythmic layers. Now, it can sound like chaos, but when you take it apart, you see how simple the individual layers really are. So let's do that. First, we have some eighth notes, which are the rhythmic foundation of the whole passage. Then we have quarter notes in the first violins, which they play near the bridge to get a really eerie sound. And the firsts are aided and abetted, as it were, by the flutes and the basses. Third, there are these two note fanfares. Then there's another set of fanfares played twice as slowly. Layer five is this sustained melody in the tubas. Layer six is an even slower melody that soars above in the horns. All these layers, and we haven't even added the rhythmic heart of the orchestra yet, and that's the percussion who are led by the timpani. which are aided and abetted by the bass drum and tam-tam. Then the guiro, which you usually hear in Latin music, adds its own little rhythmic complication. And when you put all those eighth notes, quarter notes, fanfares, melodies, and rhythmic complications together, they combine into this sheer sonic savagery. It may sound like chaos, but it is highly structured 
meticulously organized chaos. Incredibly complex sound worlds built from the simplest of materials. That's the Rite of Spring. One last bit of trivia we can't resist sharing with you before we play the piece. There's no proof at all that this was intentional. But at the very end of the piece, after the chosen virgin has danced herself to death and her soul has left her body, the final note in performance is unfortunately too short for us to be able to hear that in the basses from bottom to top. Their four note chord is spelled, follow this now, D, E, A, D. Dead. We hope you enjoy Igor Stravinsky's Rite of Spring.